Well, hey, everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, a channel where we're passionate about the beautiful simplicity and transformative power of the gospel. Hey, if you've been watching these videos and you're enjoying them, I'd really encourage you, if you haven't already, to hit subscribe to become a part of what we're doing here today. And if you really don't want to miss anything, be sure to hit the notification bell to stay in the loop. Well, I'm really excited you're here today because today we have, I, I don't know how to play this cool. It's, it's, the most exciting interview I've done personally, because the person I got to interview today is someone that's been pivotal in my theological journey, inspired me to go study theology academically and just played a big role in my faith. And that is Dr. Tim Mackey of The Bible Project. It was so much fun. We had a great conversation and I think you're really going to enjoy it. We talk about what is the Bible. I know that sounds like a basic question, but often we have such misconceptions about it. And I think he really helps understand where the Bible came from, the process, what it means for the Bible to be a unified story that leads to Jesus, and how we should interact with the Bible then. We even talk about, you know, how this understanding of biblical theology can work towards greater unity in the church. We talk about all kinds of fun things. I think you're going to enjoy it. I know that I did. Well, we'll get to that in just a second, but before we do, I want to say a huge thank you to my patron subscribers and merch buyers who make this possible, especially to my patrons who give monthly. Thank you so much for your support. Because of you, not only is this channel sustainable, but it allows it to grow into exciting and new things like interviews like this and more church tours and all types of things that are coming up. So if you want to support the channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity or using the link in the description down below. I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today, Kindred. Kindred is a ministry that exists to help people reclaim sacred time with God in their daily lives. And they do this by creating these beautiful Bibles complete with full page illustrations and pictures that will help you slow down, read the Bible differently, read more contemplatively, and I think you'll get a lot more out of it because of it. And so if you want to check them out, you can do so at kindredapostle.com and use the promo code GOSPEL10 for 10% off your order. Well, with all that being said, I hope you enjoy this video, maybe even half as much as I did. Here it is. Today, I am joined by Dr. Tim Mackey. For many years, Tim Mackey served as a pastor and part-time professor at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. These days, he spends most of his time researching, writing, and offering creative direction at Bible Project. Tim's spiritual journey began with loving parents who waited patiently for him to discover Jesus in his late teens. He started following Jesus because of an outreach ministry called Skate Church. Tim was introduced to the wonderful world of biblical studies and languages during his education at Multnomah University. He fell in love with biblical literature and developed a passion for understanding Jesus in his historical and cultural context. Tim was so fascinated with Jesus' Jewish heritage that he went on to pursue a degree in theology from Western Seminary and then gained a PhD in Hebrew Bible and Jewish studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His early research and writing interests focused on the manuscript history of the Bible and the formation of the biblical canon. All along, Tim was fascinated with the literary artistry and design of biblical narrative and poetry. But most of all, he loved pe helping people understand how the overall biblical story works together and leads us to Jesus. Tim, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, Austin, it's great to, great to be talking with you. As you were reading that, I actually remember the day I worked with a friend to help write that. Oh, nice. <laughs> and it was awkward because I don't, I don't like to talk about myself very much. And so, uh, but it was like, I needed to do it for our website. And so there you go. I'm glad it is a helpful summary. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. And I can definitely understand the uh, apprehension and talking about yourself. But I think everyone's going to be very excited to get some of that background on you. And I always like to kind of follow up with the bio. That one's written very accessibly, unlike many people's bios that I come across <laughs> that are a couple years yeah. old and I have to update right before the interview because they yeah, have right. three more children since they last wrote it or they're teaching somewhere else. Um, but to use <laughs> your guys' language, you know, I'd love to know a little more about how you became a card-carrying Bible nerd. So you went to Multnomah, you fell in love yeah. with it, but there's yeah. a big gap between loving the Bible and writing a dissertation on, what was it, the manuscript history of Ezekiel? Like, I imagine yeah. that's a bit of a gap for some people. So what inspired you to kind of take it to that next step and begin studying and pursuing this academically? Yeah, well, um, it was slow, you know, it was slow. Um, the skate church, the skateboard park ministry that I mentioned was a really 
key um, season in my life. It was a really neat community work, you know, it was a skateboard park. And so I got to skate a lot, which was, you know, my passion and, uh, and interest and hobby and life and everything else. Uh, but, you know, it was a community just focused around Jesus, trying to follow his teachings and uh, tell other people about him. It was really simple. And so that was my first community of faith. And so um, the Bible was held with really high regard. And it's a thing you memorize and talk about and just read. Like we would go skating and then go to a coffee shop and read Galatians out loud. And then just like, what does it mean? <laughs> like that was Friday night with my friends. And so I think out of that, just I came, I didn't have Bible baggage from my childhood. And so all of these um, associations with Jesus and with the Bible, it was positive except for the parts that I couldn't understand, which were like a lot, <laughs> like a lot. And, uh, and most of it, it was almost all brand new to me, you know? And so uh, th there was a Christian college across the street from the skate park. Like that was the first step that I didn't plan. And um, so I had some friends uh, who were in the skate ministry who had signed up for classes. And uh, someone asked me to teach a Bible study to the junior high skateboarders and so I was like I don't, I don't have anything to say and so I was like I'll just sign up for some classes and go with my friends and um you know I was just a couple professors who just blew my view of the universe uh as well as how they could engage with the scriptures was just beautiful and compelling and all of a sudden I'm learning about history and culture and language and I was just hooked. I, I don't know what else to say. I just thought it was the coolest stuff in the world. Um, so I finished a, a degree there. And by the end of that four years, I was two years into Greek and Hebrew and like, but so were my friends. It was, so it was a whole like crew of us who were doing it together. And then my last year, I was two years into Greek, one year into Hebrew. And I um, started you know how when the New Testament authors quote from the first three quarters of the Bible <laughs> and mm -hmm. and then when you compare them, the words are different and you're wondering, like, how did they get this from that? And why are the words different? So once I learned about this thing called the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible and the complexity of the manuscript history of the Bible in the Second Temple period, um, then I went and just started reading the Septuagint, and then I learned about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I started reading those, and then I got so down this rabbit hole of like, where did this whole thing come from in the first place? And that one lasted me about a decade and led me to two different schools and multiple degrees, and I loved it. I got to the bottom of those questions, at least for me personally, in a way that I was able to synthesize um, my view that in these texts, God really speaks to his people, but also my views were really modified and developed through that whole process. And I'm happy to talk about that. Um, cause, cause again, at the skate park, it, it was a golden tablets falling from heaven. The Bible originated of course, yes, by human authors, but their agency wasn't that significant cause it's God's word. And so that was the emphasis. And the more time that I spent in the actual history and text of the Bible, a, a more complex picture emerged that was actually more profound and beautiful and coherent to me, but more complex. And uh, that's been a really significant part of my journey. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think yeah. that's, that's going to segue really well to where we're going with this conversation in general today about what is the Bible? Because like you, I kind of grew up that it fell from the sky and that's just kind of how it worked. And then yeah. Later in my life, when I began kind of pushing away, I thought, you know, as that view falls, then so falls my faith in a way. Mm -hmm. And then you guys played a big role in kind of just helping me realize the the literary beauty of the Bible and being able to have a more holistic view. And so we're going to get into that 
um, mm-hmm. a bit here, but I do want to just kind of ask because so many people uh, are going to be familiar with your work. And I thought about just like playing it cool as though this was a super normal interview for me to do, but I'm so excited <laughs> to be doing this. And you guys yeah, have played please. such a role in my yeah. life. So I, I'm so grateful that you took the time to do this. And I'd love, yeah. you know, for maybe if there's like a few people that aren't familiar with Bible Project or the story yeah. of it that watch my channel, could you just let them know, like, how did that get started? Because it's become such a wonderful thing that's impacted yeah. so many people, including yeah. myself. Yep, it's impacted me too. <laughs> um, uh, my whole life, in fact. Uh, so at that skate park back in college, um, there was one guy, John Collins, who I met, and um, we were both interns there. So we lived together for a sh- just one short summer uh, was when we first met. And uh, I don't, yeah, what I remember about John was just um, he w- asked really great questions and um, in a persistent kind of way that was unique, it was different. Like he wouldn't let go of a question, he would turn it from multiple angles and then you would discover there's actually a, a deeper question for him underneath that first four that kind of thing. He was that guy and I loved it because I'm just, this is the coolest stuff in the world. And um, so those are, our friendship was built from the way back about talking about Bible and theology. And then um, the women that we were dating that became our wives were also friends. And so uh, as the years went by, and even when we moved away, when we came back to town, um, there would be times when we would all get together as, as couples and, and we would just continue the conversation <laughs> as if we hadn't you know, moved away from each other. So when I moved back here from, to, uh, to Portland, he pitched the idea to me of this whole thing. He was uh, a few, f- a few f- five plus years into having started a business making short animated explainer videos. And so it was a uh, doing really well. Um, this was around 2011 or so, but he was kind of bored making explainer videos about technology and cloud computing and stuff. And so he approached me with the idea of like, hey, we've talked about all this stuff through the years. What if we made some YouTube videos that summarize key ideas in the Bible? using this animated short explainer medium. So I was like, yes, awesome. What a fun idea. So that was it. We were like eating deli sandwiches, you know, like when <laughs> when it was born, so to speak. So uh, we worked out of his studio just a half a day a week for a couple of years um, with artists who worked there. And um, it was just a side gig and we, uh, made the first couple of videos, long process to that. But um, we decided instead of trying to go raise money, um, what if we could raise money for the first few and then um, you do our own style Kickstarter where if we became a non filed for nonprofit status, we could build our own Kickstarter mechanism and just invite people to give if they wanted us to make more videos. And so we also thought that would help us know if we were wasting our time. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what we did. And from the first two videos we released in May 2014, um, a growing audience has found value in them, found them helpful, and has wanted to help us uh, make more. So we're now seven years old and uh, I don't, 150 videos in and a whole bunch of other things that we've been able to start creating too. But the whole thing is just helping people understand what the Bible is, what it's trying to communicate, who Jesus is as its center, and doing it in a way that's just a simple non-religious language and trying to make no assumptions about our audience. And so um, those are kind of things that are core behind why we chose to do it. That's fantastic. And like I said, I've enjoyed it so much. We were talking right before this started that I think my mom's listened to everyone and will always call me up and ask me like questions and we dialogue about theology around the Bible project. And I'm sure there's so many other people that have similar experiences with that and have amazing stories of how Bible project has impacted them. I'm curious, you you mentioned kind of this 
uh, this you know long journey to where it is today. Was there a point that you look back on and say like this is when I realized this could really be something? I mean, this could be more than a half day at the studio. Was there yeah. a moment, or was that just kind of this slow thing where one day you looked up and you said, "I get to do this as my job." Yeah, slow. It's slow. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I went from half day a week to day a week to half time. Uh, and we were three years in before John sold out of his other company and and um, dove into this. Before I did even, I was, a, a, again, part-time professor and a full-time teaching pastor at a church. So uh, uh, between the two of us, I made the jump into doing it full time by like three ish years in and uh, not from hesitation. It was just gradual. And um, yeah, really I, the, uh, key, key moments were um, when somebody approached us, a first significant donor approached us and said, Hey, um, you've been at this for a year and you've made like six videos. <laughs> Uh, what if you could supercharge this and like do the whole Bible in a year? And we were like, whoa, uh, that's a little intense. So how about 18 months? And so uh, the Read Scripture series, which was a highly simplified visually style series, but we decided to create, um, work with another organization to create a re Bible reading app and uh, create a one-year Bible reading plan with videos for every book of the Bible. So we did that in 18 months. And by the end of that 18 months, we had an enormous amount of momentum and um, enough to be able to have a full-time studio and for me to shift on full-time. So for me, that was a season where it was like, oh, I think this is the thing that I'm going to do. Um, so yeah, that was like in 2014 to excuse me, that was probably late 15 to 16. Okay. So, but I, you know, I don't, I was five years ago and uh, things keep happening. I feel like I'm late to the game. I like things keep happening. And like three or four months later, John will say something. He'll be like, Oh, that was really significant. That thing that happened and I missed it even though I was there, <laughs> but now I see anyway. Yeah. Life is that, so that's, that's wonderful. And I, I remember watching the live stream when you guys released the Revelation video. You had oh, finished yeah, totally. Read Scripture. In fact, it's kind of getting cut off by the camera, but I'll pull it up for a second. The uh, the coffee table book is right there oh, behind yeah, me. Totally. Yeah, sure. And, uh, but yeah, I remember you saying like this was like your second PhD, the amount of work that went into doing yeah. all of those Read Scripture videos. And if people haven't seen them, you guys walk through every single book of the Bible and give like the literary structure and the message of it. I'll be linking yeah. to all of that. But again, yeah. something that's been really helpful for me and I'm sure so many others. And you hinted at today, you guys are doing more than just those initial read scripture videos. There's so yeah. much going on and a lot of yeah. different animation styles. And then you also have the podcast, which I referenced in passing, which goes a lot deeper for any one of your episodes. There's hours of podcast uh, conversation, mm -hmm. at least in the, like the theme videos. And then you also have the classroom experience now, yeah. which is yeah. really incredible. I'd be curious with all of that going on, is there something you can put your finger on of like, this is my favorite part of what I get to do? Oh, hmm. well, I'm a hyper introvert and I obviously love learning and research and so um my favorite days are days with no meetings <laughs> and uh um i have to like a, any academic you have to work hard to create that time and space but i force myself to because it's the when there's, i'm in piles of books in hebrew bible and the septuagint and the new testament's open and i'm in the zone that's the it's a really happy space for me so, but talking with John uh, for hours and hours as we are working towards writing a script, a short script for a video is a, probably m m one of my most favorite parts because if we're doing the same thing we were doing 20 years ago, <laughs> uh, his persistent questions. And I learn from his questions because he forces me to realize I'm not clear or I didn't understand the thing that I thought I did. And then we need to figure out how it makes sense together. And I just, I love it. So um, yeah, yeah, there you go. The classroom is 
fun too. We're filming live classes and packaging them for online. And uh, but again, for me, it's a learning environment, and I think that's why it's my other one of my other favorite parts is because I just love to learn. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I you know I know there will be people that will hear that and be like. You love being under a pile of books, but I, I'm right there with you. And I think most of my audience is there with you as well. Of yeah. Just what a joy that is to get to do that for your job and then to get to share it with so many people as well, I'm sure is a really yeah. special thing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, what learning at its essence is acknowledging that I have huge gaps in my understanding of the world and um, any learning that I do will enrich my experience of being a human so why wouldn't i want to and a certain temperaments too let's be honest about that you know and so my wife has a totally different view of the universe and lives in it and my life is better for it um because she's not like me at all but uh learning is a, a way to enrich our human humanity especially when it's literature that's exploring the core questions of what it even means to be human why we're here in the first place. So it's the coolest stuff in the world. It really is. And it's really neat that you have that balance. My fiance is the same way. Sometimes I'll, I'll call her and be like, I just learned this thing. Isn't this so interesting? And sometimes it'll be yes. And a lot of times I'll be like, no, that's not yeah, interesting. Totally. Only you think that's interesting. It's exactly. <laughs> and they're like, well, and at least some other people too, but that's okay. Yeah. It doesn't have to be interesting at home. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> oh, well, I want to transition a bit to talk about what the Bible is, because I think that's one of the most distinctive experience of my uh, interfacing with Bible Project is the conversations you guys have around what the Bible is, but also what the Bible isn't. And this comes up a lot in the podcast, I've noticed, a lot with John, and kind of wrestling through what you referred to as you didn't have as much of, like Bible baggage, and talking about kind of just common evangelical understandings of what the Bible is, and we talked about it falling from heaven, and how that can be kind of detrimental. But then it shows up in all different ways. Of We think the Bible is one thing, but it ends up being something else. And if we try to apply the wrong understanding of the Bible, then mm -hmm. we go down all these kind of funny paths. And so mm -hmm. I'd be curious of, you know, what do you see as some of the most common misunderstandings of what the Bible is? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, it, and it does, it spans bigger than Protestant conservative circles, you know, in Europe or America. I mean, I think these are pretty widespread uh, patterns in how people engage the Bible across Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, I, I find at least. Um, so I, I think because it's big, complicated, and ancient, um, most Christians and most traditions end up settling with a more handleable approach <laughs> to reading the Bible. And uh, in my experience, which is just my experience, uh, but across a pretty broad variety of Protestant and Anglican traditions, is a, a handbook view mentality to approaching the Bible or a reference book. And so whether um, it's the behavior manual, um, and so we're talking about formative stuff here from kids who grew up in youth group and the Bible is open when I'm being told to be this way or to not do this thing. And that stuff makes a deep impression. And then uh, all of a sudden you're years into forming somebody who it's a reference book. And when I want to know what to do to make God happy or what makes God angry, I'd go to this page and this sentence on the page that says that thing. Um, or it's or another reference book approach is like a, a theology dictionary. Um, I want to believe the correct things, or my group believes this, but not what that other group does. Why do I believe that? Well, go to this page and look at this paragraph, or just this sentence in the paragraph. And so, I, I wish I were a making a caricature, but but you, it's not a caricature. That's how people are often exposed to the Bible, or just little snippets, the little snippets that make you feel God's love. And, and so the trick is, is that um, all of those um, practices are actually tuned into the right instincts for what scripture is and has been for millennia, which is um, 
a set of texts that are meant to shape our view of reality as followers of Jesus. They're meant to form us and form our moral compass and our sense of what is good and not good. Um, it's meant to connect us in a living way to an actual person, uh, Jesus. Um, so the question really is in how. It's in the execution, <laughs> poor execution. Um, you know, you, it, my son, um, when he was three, had the right instinct that the hammer was a tool. But then when he turned it around and started using it as a shovel, it was like right instinct, wrong execution. And so I think that's what those behaviors with the Bible, the reference manual behaviors, that's, it's similar. Um, you're just, you're not only going to end up making the Bible do and say things it really wasn't designed to say and do when you treat it like a reference book, but also you're going to miss out on what these texts were designed to accomplish. And so, so that's kind of the double challenge. That's my very short, and that wasn't very short, but that's my short end way of my own experience of seeing people's struggles with the Bible that lead to unhelpful practices. Thank you. What I found really helpful in that too was the recognition of it comes from a good impulse. I think some people kind of swing to another extreme. They say, oh, I realize now that the Bible isn't, you know, this uh, moral handbook or this thing of telling me how to live. Yeah. And so therefore it says nothing about how I yeah. should live. And yeah, sure. that we kind of swing from these extremes. And I think it's helpful to see like, hey, you know, just because we've recognized, okay, it's not quite what you thought that you, you had the right idea, wrong application. It's in the yeah. how. And I think that that's just helpful for people as they kind of, I know a lot of people watching this might be kind of in like a deconstruction period where they're kind of getting rid of some of the old ways that they might have approached scripture. Um, and mm -hmm. they might be tempted to swing to another extreme, which we often mm -hmm. don't find uh, the truth at when we just kind of swing back and forth in that way. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. That's a great way of putting it. Um, and I, I think, Again, in my own experience, I, I never had a baggage that I had to deconstruct. Uh, this was all in my 20s and just discovering it all. And it was awesome. Um, John, my partner in the project, had a lot more of that baggage that he needed to take apart uh, and check some things at the door. But through our years of talking, it's also that's happened simultaneously with discovering all of these way more profound realizations about what what the, the scriptures are and can be and so I, i'm with you i'm with you the point isn't to um ditch the thing that actually can enrich your life it's just to make sure we're treating it the way it's designed to be treated yeah i think you know maybe a quick illustration of that and she'll be delighted that she's getting another shout out in this conversation with you but my mom <laughs> After, you know, having lots of conversations with me around theology and, you know, through Bible Project episodes, she was reflecting on her, she worked in ministry and kids ministry, and they used to have this program where one of the slogans was, where do you go when you have a problem? It'd be God's mm. word. And she would mm. be like, did I mess up all these kids by like thinking like, because it was in like a drama <laughs> thing. And then like there would yeah, be a scripture sure, sure. that would kind of, and it was like, yeah. well, you know, it was the right instinct, maybe not like the the most holistic, healthy approach to the Bible as uh, this is going to so solve like all your relational conflicts by the time you find the right verse. But yeah. <laughs> all isn't lost that you uh, taught kids totally. that the Bible does say something about, you know, how you handle life. Totally. That's right. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to tell because that can usually it's not just one or two things like that. It's usually... Uh, communities, if, especially communities of Christian faith that uh, are unhealthy, usually what they're doing with the Bible is just one thing that's unhealthy among a whole bunch of other things. But, you know, it helps to address as many things as you can. And so if we can help people understand this one, I think that can actually illuminate a lot of other unhealthy things that have developed in different parts of the Christian tradition, but that's a whole other conversation, maybe. Yeah, I'm sure there's so many rabbit trails to chase down, which is probably why there's hours of podcast episodes for every yeah. one video that comes out, which is a really yeah. fun part of what you guys do. But speaking of the podcast, if anyone's listened to the podcast or the videos, they have heard you guys talk about the Bible being a unified story that leads 
to Jesus. And so we've talked a bit about what the Bible is not, which you guys do a lot on your podcast as well. But I want to move into a little bit of this, you know, kind of definition yeah. or this kind of like motto of what you guys are about and what the Bible is as a unified story that leads to Jesus. Well, hey, everyone, we will get right back to the interview. But first, I wanted to thank another sponsor today, and that is Faithful Counseling. I am so excited to be partnering with Faithful Counseling. They are an organization that exists to help you get the help that you need. You know, one of the first YouTube videos I ever made was titled, You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too. Today, so many people are struggling with their mental health, and the last thing we need to do is create a stigma around it that keeps people from getting the help they need. And I want to do my part to help you all reach out and find the resources that can be helpful for you. And I think Faithful Counseling could be one of those things. Faithful Counseling is a group of Christian counselors. And no matter where you are in the Christian tradition, they have counselors from across uh, the spectrum of denominations. And if that's important to you, they can try to link you up with someone uh, that matches your background. But their counselors, they are all licensed counselors with over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with them from any country in the world, and you can connect with them in four different ways. You can do video sessions, phone calls, live chat, and messaging. These are people that are here to help you, and I really think that you could benefit from them. If you are struggling, you do not need to be doing this alone, and I really encourage you to check them out. You can do so by going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do that, if you go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, not only will you get 10% off your first month, but you can be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours, which is absolutely incredible. You'll be getting counseling from a Christian perspective, and you'll be on the path to doing the work and getting the help that you need. So I'd really encourage you to check them out, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. Also, I want to let you know that this is not a crisis line. If you are currently experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, please reach out to a crisis line. You can find one at www.crisistextline.org. You do not want to go through this alone. And please reach out if you are experiencing those things. Well, once again, I hope that if this is something that would be helpful for you, that you will check that out. You can find the link in my description. I want to do my part, as I said, to end the stigma. I hope that you will as well. Let's help people get the help they need to be on the path towards healing and hope. So go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. So if you don't mind, I'd love to unpack that kind of in three phases. What does it mean for the Bible to be unified? What does it mean to be a story? And what does it mean to lead to Jesus? Yep. So starting with this yep. idea of the Bible being unified, I mean, no small amount of ink has been shed by theologians over you know the unity and the diversity of Scripture and how all of that works together. And mm -hmm. most of it's probably in the section of books that most people find really boring and don't get read. <laughs> but in any case, when you guys say the Bible is unified, what do you yeah. mean by that? Because if they, you know, watch your videos or listen to the podcast, what you guys aren't doing is kind of just glossing over all the differences. You're showing the literary beauty of each individual author and all of these things, yeah. but yet it all does work together. So in your words, what does it mean for the Bible to be unified? Yep. Yeah. Well, um, so when, yeah, when we say the word Bible, um, we're talking about two main literary collections. Um, one's the Hebrew Bible. Um, so the Hebrew Bible predates um, Christianity, predates Jesus. Um, and so this is a collection of ancient Jewish literature that came into existence slowly over the period of a millennium and a half um, through a set of dynamics and forces and a history that's the, so cool <laughs> and fascinating to learn about. And um, it's one of those fields in terms of the composition history of the Hebrew Bible. It, they're truly, you know, with the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in the mid 1900s, you know, we, we took steps forward in our understanding of the origin of the Bible. And so there is, it's not a done sealed deal. Um, and it also wasn't done in like a corner of a room with, you know, like a small circle of people trying to take over the world. <laughs> um, this is ancient Jewish literature that comes out of the life and history of ancient Israelites. Um, however, uh, this particular collection emerged out of a group, the, the, the perspective 
the, the Hebrew Bible is offering doesn't reflect, apparently, it seems, what average Israelites believed in ancient history. Uh, this collection comes from a group uh, that held a minority view um, throughout much of Israel's history. Um, and uh, in, in the later books of the Hebrew Bible, this is called the groups that produced all this, the, the uh, scribes and the prophets. Um, and, and then they came to call themselves the righteous ones and the, the remnant and so on. So um, Israel was an ancient Near Eastern tribal kingdom, um, but there was this group that was preserving a history and a sense of identity that they weren't just a random ancient people group, but they were a family called by the creator God that they believed there was one of, not a bunch, and that was unique. Um, that this family had a unique purpose in human history and that the creator was going to do something for all humanity through this family. Uh, the problem was that this family was really morally compromised and invited a lot of disaster into their lives. And uh, their collective history ended in ruin uh, in, in a, an event called the Babylonian exile. And the Hebrew Bible was like, really went into an intense period of shaping in that period. And out the other side emerged a much shrunken group of ancient Israelites who came back to the land and rebuilt their life there. And um, a couple centuries go by and you've got this collection, a diverse collection. So when we say unified, when we're talking about the Hebrew Bible, it's unified the way that like a museum exhibit of artifacts is unified period, right? It can be from all different periods, but the, the final organization and the way that you're being led through a set of ideas intentionally as you go through the exhibit is, is a unified, it comes from a unified final mind, as it were. And that's the kind of unity that I'm talking about when it comes to the Hebrew Bible. And so, um, and that collection is coming into its final shape the Dead Sea Scrolls give us a window into that period. We're talking like in the 200s BC, before a couple last couple centuries before Jesus. Its textual final collection is coming into form, and um, and so when Jesus appears on the scene, he's making claims that this whole thing was leading up to who to him and to what he was saying and doing, and. Um, he believed that he was going to take all of Israel's history to this culminating moment by going to Jerusalem to die on purpose at the hands of the Romans and of his own people. <laughs> and, um, and he also anticipated that this creator God was going to vindicate him and bring him out the other side and then do something for the whole creation. And this, this story is told four times over. <laughs> in uh, another collection called the New Testament. And um, the New Testament stems out of this guy, Jesus, who did this stuff and, uh, and then commissioned his followers to go spread the news of what he did, that he was the king of the world. And so we have the letters and writings of his followers. And then we have four accounts that all go back to that earliest circle of his followers. Um, that came into emergence and the new testament you know it's 27 books that came into existence not in a millennia and a half but like in a few decades uh these all these texts were written however um different than ancient israel which was the kingdom the jesus movement was a very organic um viral movement going multilingual cross-cultural from the first like years and so it took more time and a different process for those writings from, from the, the apostles. Um, I call them deputies, because um, I think that word works a little more in English for what the word apostle means. It's the people that Jesus deputized to represent him. And so it actually took um, a much longer process for the Jesus movement as it spread, for these original writings to kind of rise to the surface. And so, it's in the three late 200s, early 300s that you have official groups of Christians, like saying these are the writings of the apostles that we're all like down for. 
But what they're doing there is acknowledging what's been happening already for centuries um, of people reading and privileging the writings of the apostles. And so the, the unity of the New Testament is different than the unity of the Hebrew Bible because the New Testament doesn't come from a single mind in the same way. It doesn't have a final, it's more like, oh, I've used so many different metaphors, metaphors through the years. It's much more like um, uh, an aspen forest that's, you know, aspen forests are like um, uh, uh, one biological organism. Hmm. Um, so like there's these massive, you know, it'd be square miles of Aspen forest, but it's really one thing underneath all connected. That's like what the Hebrew Bible is. The New Testament is much more like going to a nursery and um, uh, uh, like a plant nursery and similar types of plants, but that all came from like the founders of the nursery or something have been organized into a certain section. But here's the thing for both the Hebrew Bible and for the New Testament, these collections weren't the only shows in town. Um, like the Israelites didn't stop writing books. Um, so there's a whole host of literature around the Bible in all of these periods um, that were written and well-read and, pop and popular, but they didn't have the same acknowledgement from the broad array of um, followers of Jesus. And so this was maybe way too long of an explanation. <laughs> um, That's fantastic. But, yeah, so so when we say unified um, for the Hebrew Bible, I, it's been editorially unified. For the New Testament, you would say it's thematically unified. It's unified in terms of its content, what it's about. It's all about Jesus and what happened with him and then the implications of that as the movement spread. Um, and so what, then when you put all this together, the Hebrew Bible going forward, the writings of the apostles looking back and forward and the person linking all of it together is Jesus of Nazareth. And he said the whole thing was leading up to him and what he was doing. And then there, all of it goes out of him and what he did and what he's still doing. So that's what we mean when we say the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. I have problems being concise when I talk no. about my topics. That's been, no, that's really helpful. And, you took that in directions that I wasn't even expecting, which was really interesting to hear what's in your mind when you're talking about unified. There's this sense that mm. the, you know, the Old Testament points to Jesus and the New Testament is looking back, but also the structural uh, unification of these books, like how they came yeah. about, which I think is going to be really interesting for people yeah. to hear about. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yes. This is, these are topics that are so fascinating. You can actually spend years uh, reading and understanding the significance of them. So I'm happy to talk about whatever. That's awesome. And I believe if I recall, I think I watched it a while ago. You have, I think on YouTube, you can find, I don't think it's on Bible projects channel, but it might be on your archives of like hours of lectures on how we got oh. the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. I, I think those are out there somewhere. So I'll try to link to those. Yeah. Cheers. Yep. Yeah. That is out there somewhere. Um, whoever started that YouTube channel, <laughs> put it up there. And uh, I, st I still don't know who it is, but. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Okay. That's awesome. Well, shout out to them. That's yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, so the second big part there is the Bible is, it's not just unified, but it's a unified story that leads to Jesus. And you talked a little bit about what it means to lead to Jesus. But this aspect of story, I think this really comes out in what you guys do. You focus a lot on literature and not that the bible is only literature but it certainly is as i record this my yep. laptop is kind of sketchily sitting on the box of robert alter's hebrew bible someone who yeah. was yeah. huge in you know and yeah. teaching me what it means for the bible to be art and narrative and all of that but yep. so what do you mean by when you say that it's a story i imagine there might that might be multifaceted um, yep. but i'd be curious what what you're getting at there yeah Yep. Well, story is just a more normal word than the English word narrative. Um, <laughs> but um, so, you know, what just facts on the ground, um, a third of the Hebrew Bible and New Testament each uh, is narrative. Um, for the Hebrew Bible, another third of it is poetry. Uh, and then for the Hebrew Bible, the final third fits into an in-between of what you could call discourse. 
um, what we might think of direct, um, not like nonfiction writing in our, you know, in our bookstores today, uh, speeches and essays and so on. So um, not all of it is narrative in terms of its literary form. However, um, the basic unifying uh, themes and content all have a narrative shape to them. Um, I, so this is actually way more intuitive. It's just the, you pick it up and page one says, in the beginning. <laughs> like, oh, a story's beginning. Um, and it's a narrative uh, that begins with creation and then the next main narrative block where it concludes is with the first main narrative block in the Hebrew Bible. In, in the traditional ordering of the Hebrew Bible, it's actually slightly different than contemporary Protestant and Catholic Bibles. Um, so the first main narrative block in the Hebrew Bible is the book of Genesis through a book called Second Kings, which ends with the Israelites going to exile in Babylon. That's the first main narrative block. But then um, the rest of the Hebrew Bible is organized into two big mega sections after that. One is a collection of poetry mostly called the prophets. And then a book called the a section called the writings, um, which is like that um, drawer that most of us have in our kitchens. That's like matches and batteries <laughs> and rubber bands. Uh, but then also like your charge cords and your photo album. It's that drawer. So way more intentional. The, the section of the Hebrew Bible is way more intentional, but it has a lot of variety. Um, so the prophets, what they're doing is each of the books of the prophets, there's 12, and each one of them begins with a little editorial note that links it back into the story you just read. So it's a whole section of poetry, but all of the poetry is located in moments in the story. So it's governed by the narrative. Um, and actually the same goes for most, almost all of the books in the writings. Uh, they'll begin with little headings that link them into the story. And so the, the story only progresses a little bit forward from the Babylonian exile. Um, there's a, a couple books about um, some groups that went back to the land after they were freed uh, and things didn't go very well. And then there's a couple books about people who were able to flourish because they were faithful to God's purposes even while living in exile. And so the Hebrew Bible ends in its narrative shape with a small group having returned full of hope of God doing all of the things that he said he was going to do to rescue the world and them, and none of them coming to realization. And so in terms of its thematic ideas and themes, it's an incomplete narrative that is forward looking towards some kind of resolution. So that's the Hebrew Bible. That just is the Hebrew Bible. Um, and so different Jewish groups in those late periods as it came to its final formation were all anticipating something going to happen that would carry the story forward. And so this is why the Dead Sea Scrolls are so cool because it's a group of former priests um, who thought the, the people running the show in Jerusalem were so corrupt that they went out into the desert to go start their own new thing um, and wait for the, everybody else to die. <laughs> um, and so they represent a group that thought they were fulfilling the story of the Hebrew Bible, um, a people that would be faithful to God, that would recapture God's purpose to have humans ruling over the world in wisdom and power and love, um, and that evil would be somehow dealt with in the nations once and for all. So Jesus comes onto the scene, and um, as I said earlier, he says the whole thing is coming to its fulfillment in him, the, the incomplete story. And so Jesus becomes this pivotal moment, pivot moment. Now, of course, if you don't believe Jesus is who he says he is, it's a non-starter. Um, you know, you just go out to the Dead Sea or go, you know, do something else, go golfing or something. Um, but if you believe in who Jesus is, who he says he is, then the story like carries forward and he brings Israel's story to its fulfillment, but then um, launches uh, the renewed people of God around himself that goes out to all of the nations. And then the last book of the Bible the second to last page ends with a paragraph where the narrative actually ends and it says, and they reigned forever and ever. <laughs> and you're just like it. It's, yeah. It actually couldn't be more self-evident. <laughs> that yeah, it's a huge story. 
it's intuitive and it's one of those yeah. things that because of all the even though it's intuitive you have you know countless examples not to caricature it too much but you know where it says in the beginning it's intuitive it's a, you know there's that we're starting a narrative yeah, you, yeah a lot of people think that it's like the prologue to a science textbook or something and of course that's another conversation yeah. but yeah, yeah. it is and it's one of those things that i feel like you know i i have this i think about this and be like this is incredible like we need to talk to people about this and i tell someone like the bible is a story and they'd be like yeah like you you had to read books to know that <laughs> yeah sure uh, that's right that's right so you could say the basic concept actually is not that hard to grasp it's pretty intuitive the implications of that concept for what we do with the bible in our church communities and as individuals the implications are vast <laughs> and often under realized which I, th I think is probably what you're tapping into there yeah i think that's a really good way of putting that and you know this is, i was going to preface this with uh, quickly but that might not be a, a good adverb to put before this question but what do you think we lose when we lose sight of just as you said facts on the ground we've got a third as narrative here and that it has mm -hmm. this intuitively narratival shape what do we lose when we lose sight of that well um yeah well, one i think fairly obvious implication is that we lose what it's actually about um when we make it about something else <laughs> and we may not think we're making it about something else but if we are treating it, engaging it in this reference book kind of way, we inevitably will be distorting its story in some way. Um, so when um, there's a story at the end of uh, the third gospel in the New Testament, Luke, the gospel according to Luke, and Jesus is having this resurrection Bible study with his deputies, with his closest followers. And when he summarizes the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, uh, he says, didn't you know that this was all going to happen, that um, the Messiah would go into a period of suffering and death and be vindicated and raised to honor so that forgiveness could be announced in his name to all of the nations? That's his summary of the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> and so you just have to stop and say, if that's not what I'm seeing in the Hebrew Bible or what I'm going to it to see, then I think I'm off track with what it is and what it's for. Um, another place that's very similar, but a different author was Paul the Apostle in, um, in his book, letter called The Second Letter to Timothy, who's a young protege. Um, he talks about how Timothy was raised on the scriptures and, and taught them from his family and community. And then he has this, this famous line because he uses, he calls um, the scriptures, uh, depends on your translation it'll say inspired or god breathed by which he's uploading a whole theology of god's spirit works in the world through humans who have been supercharged to bring their brilliance uh to meet with the power of god to create this partner product um that's what he means by inspired that it's a divine human partnership and and then what he says they're, they're about he says it's wisdom literature. It's so fascinating. He says it's designed to give us wisdom about how we need to be rescued by trusting in the Messiah. And then he says who he believes the Messiah's name is, Jesus. So Paul calls it wisdom literature that's, that has a narrative underneath it. There's some problem that requires some rescue uh, by a representative figure. And so he's thinking, we're in, and this is in the middle of a letter. It's not a narrative in terms of the literary form. But when he reflects on what the whole thing's about, he reflects on it as a narrative that came, that crisis came to its resolution in Jesus. So once you put those, this is the two of the most important authority for voices in early Christianity, and they conceive of the whole of the scriptures as a unified story that leads to Jesus. Imagine. <laughs> um, so when you're doing that, it will all, all of a sudden, any story that you're, any little story, so that's a big story. There's hundreds of little stories, hundreds of little poems, hundreds of little sections, dozens of letters that were written to specific people. And they all represent different lower level moments in the story. 
And so it's learning to honor that narrative design. And so anytime I'm reading anywhere, it's, it's disingenuous to just take out a paragraph and just say, see what God says to you. That's not, and it's not, I'm not even trying to make an authority claim there. I'm just saying that's not a way to respect these texts. If you wrote a letter to somebody and hundred years later, someone pulls out one sentence and like applies it to this thing that you, you didn't have in mind. And that's just, that's not responsible. And so it's learning to honor the narrative context in which any individual part and, and it's more work to understand, but I don't know any other way to check ourselves from uh, making the Bible serve our ends. And this is a way for me to make sure that I'm trying to hear a voice that's other than my own, uh, uh, is by hearing things in their narrative context. So, so for me, that's why it's a big deal. I, yeah, I think that's there's so much there. There's so many rabbit trails I would like to chase, but I, I think I will leave them intact. But I think that's going to be so helpful for people. And I, I hope that they're able to kind of think through that and kind of piece out the different points you're making there. Cause I think it could make a big difference for their approach to scripture. I know it has for me. Yeah. I remember you guys talking about the Bible as Jewish meditation literature, which people might hear that and be like, that sounds a little strange. And you guys have a video on it. You could check it out. <laughs> but that being kind of like a, a paradigm shift of, oh, okay. Yeah. And being able to see, and you got to use your language, kind of like the hyperlinks and how the stories relate to one another and how they're connected, but also allowing the stories to speak on their own. I think, it, you know, it's one of those things looking back, like these understandings, they just are going to propel people forth in their further study of the Bible and as they go. And I, I think it's going to be really helpful for people. Yeah, I do. Want, yeah. yeah, yeah. One, sorry, just one, no. just to, but I, um, one of the ways that Christian communities have lost credibility, especially in American culture, because the Bible is a public domain document and people do read it. Um, and so they can sniff out when people are copying, pasting, and taking things out of context, you know, like your neighbors know that Christians are doing this and that they're really bad at it. <laughs> and um, it, in many ways, it's actually a really important habit to, to uh, wean ourselves of uh, just uh, in an effort to regain credibility <laughs> uh, in the eyes. And, and also it's honoring the fact that these texts might actually be able to do something more powerful than I could have imagined. Um, sorry, when I said more powerful than you can imagine, all I hear is Obi-Wan um, when he's fighting Darth Vader in <laughs> A New Hope. But sorry, but more powerful than we imagine. Uh, these texts have immense, immense power and wisdom to offer. I, it's been my experience in, to, to say things I never would have imagined them addressing. But, I, but it came at the cost of giving up those other ways of making the Bible do the things that we, that we wanted to. I think that's a really good way of putting it. And it reminds me, uh, again, not to be like your guys' PR department, but another thing you guys did of uh, the epistle series and that feeling of like, yeah. it almost feels like you have to give up this love of like just getting one-liners from Paul. But then yeah, yeah, yeah. you're able to get something so much deeper if you approach them in their full context. And it's it's more than just, you know, motivational blurbs, but really shaping your whole worldview and answering those fundamental questions about who we are and where we're coming, where we came from, where we're going, all those yeah. things, and really approaching it for wisdom in that way. Agreed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, I would like to uh, just ask, you know, this my channel it, it brings together a really diverse background of people and i imagine you guys do as well with the reach that you guys have and i'm sure that's something you have in mind as you're making these things you said that you're specifically thinking about how can we make this accessible use everyday language but i'd be curious you know do you think that your focus on biblical theology which is what we've been talking about for those that aren't familiar with kind of the way that theology is diced up it's not just to say all theology is biblical but kind of tracing biblical themes and all of that do you think mm -hmm. that approach rather than systematic theology uh do you think that makes bringing christians together from a diverse background easier for what you guys are doing do you think there's something to that or is it simply like is that 
intentional to what you all are doing or is it just a really nice byproduct that it makes it more accessible? Yeah, you, that's a great question. Um, and I'd say for, in terms of what was on our minds from the beginning, it's a byproduct. Um, but I think we become more aware of it and its significance is be, it's growing, dawning on me. Remember I told you I'm often late to the game with important things that happen uh, with the bottom project. So it takes me a while to tune in. So I do think um, systematic theology is um, also in, in theory, a drive from the Bible, um, but it's an attempt to create a systematic and comprehensive view of X, Y, or Z um, based in my cultural setting with intellectual and cultural tools that I have at my disposal and based by my life experience. Systematic theology is the packaging of, biblical, of the ideas of the Bible and fashioning them into a holistic view of something which means filling in tons of gaps because the Bible wasn't designed to provide us with this. It was designed to be a narrative pointing to Jesus to supercharge a community of faith to go be humans in the world. So systematic theology is super important. Um, and every generation has to do it for its own self. But what that means is that our repackagings of the a biblical view of reality will always be a co-creation of the Bible and us. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. I, that's what it means to be human. Um, but it's important that we don't mistake this for the Bible. And so the Bible is generative. And the communities and the ways of being human that it can generate are really diverse because it doesn't tie everything down. And that was a mixed metaphors. I was thinking tie things in a bow, but nail everything down. <laughs> so, um, so all that to say um, is that I do think the core biblical narrative, its main themes, its own language and vocabulary can actually be a source for unity and across the uh, Jewish and Christian traditions. So this is something I'm thinking a lot more about. And I, I that's all I can say. <laughs> right now, um, we do have um, a plan uh, and we're developing a strategy to address the larger collection of writings around the Protestant Bible that are considered scripture by a big amount of Christians in the world and Catholic and Orthodox traditions are called uh, the Deuterocanon or the Apocrypha. That's a good example where this literature is so cool and it has been widely read by Christians around the world until a hundred or so years after the Reformation, Protestant, some Protestants in Europe and most Protestants in America don't read this stuff anymore. And that's really unfortunate because it's literature that comes from the period in between the final form of the Hebrew Bible and Jesus himself. If we're looking for like Jewish literature to help us understand how early Jews read their Bible, this is it. And Protestants think it's like toxic. <laughs> for some reason. And it's, so there's like another example where I think the Bible, this literature that has historically been divisive, actually could be a cool way to bring Protestants and Catholic Orthodox together. And we are trying to hatch a plan to um, produce resources on these books that are mostly unknown to Protestants and that Catholics feel like Protestants are missing out on the party. So that's an example of how we're thinking about that. That's fantastic. I'm sure the people that watch my audience or watch my videos, the largest section of which is Catholic followed by Orthodox, then Protestant, which is really interesting for me and a really fun community to get yeah. to steward. Yeah. will be really excited to hear that, that you guys are doing that. Several of my patrons asked when I told them that I'd be doing this, like, can you ask them if they'll ever do the Deuterocanonical books? And so I'm sure they'll be excited to hear that. And I think, I love that you guys are thinking through these things. There's some, there are things that I'm really passionate about. And I think, you know, I, I was going to ask, you know, for a Catholic or Orthodox listening, well, what what does the Bible Project offer them? Because they might be thinking, should I listen to theology from this Protestant guy out in Portland? Already there's one thing. But is there anything else you would say to someone that's asking that question? Mm. Well, that's, well, I mean, I, you know, I am located in the Protestant tradition and in ways that I don't even know that forms my default approaches. For me, however, what I love about biblical scholarship 
why I spent so much time honing these tools of language and historical research is so that I can check my assumptions <laughs> and not check them at the door uh, so that I'm just like, you know, a brain on a stick reading the Bible, but so that I can know where my bias points are as a West Coast white male Protestant, you know, um, and also so that I can know who's not like me, who's provided insight into this part of the Bible so I can go listen to them and read them to hear what they have to say. And so all of our content, you know, goes through a pretty thorough research process before it goes out into the world, precisely because I'm not just interested in what I have to say. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to channel what a lot of people are saying into what we're doing. And our research team is getting bigger, um, which is really fun. Um, so I, I guess that's all I'd say is that whether you're Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox, if we're trying to understand the biblical authors on their own terms, we're all trying to check our assumptions at the door and go sit at the feet of these ancient authors um, and of Jesus himself and to hear him on his own terms, not to ignore our traditions, but so that we can come back with a fresh perspective and make our traditions more faithful to the things that are core to it. And so that's what we're trying to do. I don't think we do it perfectly all the time, but it's what we're, what we're trying to do. I think that's a really great goal. And I think no matter where people are listening to this, I think they'll be able to really benefit from it. And I'd encourage them to check it out and see how we can talk together about these things, about this book that we all love and revere and think, mm. you know, in, you know, maybe diverse ways we think about it, but we think it's unlike any other book and want to derive wisdom and live from it in yeah. whatever that might mean to different people. Yeah. Well, yep. Tim, thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. This has been an absolute joy and a privilege. I'm so grateful for you. I'd like to just conclude by handing it to you, letting and allow you to let people know where they can find you and your work. And if there's any exciting things coming up at Bible Project that you want to share. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, yeah, the easiest way to find the Bible Project is just to Google Bible Project. And uh, we have a website, BibleProject.com. Uh, and then the videos are kind of out there, YouTube or all the other ones <laughs> that are out there. <laughs> so uh, that's the easy place to find our stuff. Uh, we have a podcast uh, that's in most of the podcast things. And um, there, there you go. What we're working on, we're constantly working on new stuff. Um, we're in the early phases of a 10-part video series on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7 which um, is ground zero for a Jesus-centered view of what is good and what is not good. <laughs> uh, it's Ethics 101, according to Jesus. I'm so excited about this series. And the way the visual development of the series and the style is going to be a whole new direction that our artists are spearheading. It's so cool. So I'm excited about that. Um, and also we have a new series we're exploring called Visual Commentary. We just have a couple of pilots on it that um, is trying to use 2D ge geometrics to explore literary design in smaller chapters of the Bible. So we just released a video on Psalm 8, I think, the other day. And um, trying to introduce people into literary design and literary art in the Bible, but using geometry to do it. And uh, I'm really... there's you know, over 1,200 chapters in the Bible. So this could be a long series. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. And I'm sure so many people are going to enjoy that. I can't wait to check out the visual commentaries. I don't think I've seen those yet. And so that sounds cool. really, really interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tim, thank you again. And thanks to all yeah. of you that are watching this whenever it is that you watch this. I do not take that lightly. I thank you so much for your time. And as always, I want to let you know to be on the lookout for more videos. And most importantly, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world. Mm -hmm.